So we have turned in one of those YouTube channels that just benefit from our pets. Yes, just every video is now gonna have this in it so that we can get clicks. Just You're click on the dog. The dog channel. Oh. Every video is going to have the dog. It's the hardware episode of the tech, and we have so much hardware. We did a spreadsheet, and there are like 39 videos that are in some state of edit. So Jimmy's going to be <laughs> working overtime. Uh, I'll be editing some even as, as well. Uh, but we've and we've got so much hardware coming in. I tweeted uh, yesterday, Wendell. I tweeted, we have so much hardware and almost zero time. So it's it's kind of difficult. Where I'm I'm at a point right now where I'm like looking at all the hardware and trying to figure out what really is the most important thing to show you guys first. And we've got all the 4K monitors coming. So I know some of the other tech sites are ahead of us with a few 4K monitors, but I think we're going to give you guys um, possibly... Comprehensivity. Compre <laughs> well, not even that, but I think we're really critical. A lot of people are super excited about, oh my God, the pixels and all that kind of stuff. And, and I don't think people are looking at it with um, as critical of an eye as we are, maybe. I'm, I'm not sure if I'm... <laughs> just being crazy, but I haven't liked any of the 4K monitors just yet. I haven't seen the Asus, but um, so far I'm not, I'm not entirely sold on any of them, um, other than maybe the 24-inch Dell, but that's a little too small for my taste. So Yeah, the 24-inch the Dell, even with a TN panel, was unbelievable quality. Like, it sets a new standard as far as TN panels go, which is crazy. And we're not, we're not even holding the other monitors up to that standard. We just want them to be an improved TN panel over TN panels from 2009. <laughs> no, that's a very hard thing to do. You know, 2009 <laughs> was a golden year for TN panels. Like the TN mines in uh, Botswana or whatever, they were the just twisted getting... pneumatic mines. <laughs> <laughs> the twisted yeah. pneumatic mines. They were just, they were just, you know, the best stuff was uh, was all mined that year, and that's pretty much twisted pneumatic mines. <laughs> Oh, yeah. Twisted Nomadic sounds like a band, a hair band from the 80s. <laughs> All right, we're Twisted Nomadic. Are you ready to rock and roll? They're obviously British. You in the front row, ready to rock and roll? From Liverpool. <laughs> You got it. That's exactly right. And we've got all kinds of other hardware over here. I've got a pile of surfaces and a Dell Venue Pro. <laughs> that surface is loaded with surfaces. Oh. <laughs> There's almost no surface area left. <laughs> we actually uh, have two surfaces yeah. here. I've got to do the unboxing of one, but I took one out to play with it, and so far it's been a lot of fun. And I've been testing the uh, DisplayPort hub stuff because nobody ever tests that because they <laughs> don't. It's, it's I just uh, other review sites. <laughs> well, let me tell you Angry what I just fist. got in. I, I just got a whole bunch of OCZ drives. I got the Vector, the Vertex, and I also got the Revo drive. Uh, the Revo drive is ridiculous. It's PCI Express. Uh, there's a RAID controller on board, and it's actually using Sandforce, not the Indie Links controller. So, like, I, I was expecting them to go Indie Links, but I opened it up. I was like, hey, look, Sandforce controller is on here. So, tried and true Sandforce going on. And the other thing that's pretty interesting about the Revo drive is the speed. Um, on my uh, X79 system, we're getting close to two gigabytes per second read and write. That's more than the, they even advertised on the box. And the IOPS, I'm getting like 20,000 more IOPS than they advertised on the box. So, and I've tried this with multiple different software packages, and it's just better than the specs on the box, which is almost, it's all, that's almost never happened. So maybe it's just nice because it's on X79, but uh, who knows? So a it's lot of reviews coming up. It's basically a RAID 0 of M.2 drives or a RAID 0 of just direct controller interface, and so it is ludicrously fast. So all that stuff is going to be coming up very soon. And then we also have Highlander coming up in like a week. We're going to be going and playing some video games on top of a mountain. All the nerds who can make it will be there on top with us because, of course, we're going to be on top. And uh, I'm still not going to say the secret people that are going to be there. There's going to be some surprises. And uh, we're going to be playing Doom, of course, on top. But there's going to be a few other games we'll be playing on top. And we should be breaking the Guinness Book of World Records for highest terrestrial uh, land party. I'm not looking for this to be crazy fun because when we get to the top, it's going to be like 50 mile an hour winds and 20, 30 degrees. So I'm kind of worried about the laptops blowing off. <coughs> yeah. <laughs> At 50 fun. miles an hour, that's just crazy. I, I mean, just, who knows? The laptops will blow away. Maybe it'll be a good day. But we had one of our 
a friend who was there not long ago, and he was like, yeah, man, 50 mile an hour winds at the summit. It was pretty crazy. I don't think your flag is going to stay here, let alone your laptops. But that is why this will be an epic video. It's us versus the elements versus each other. Did we put that on the <laughs> shirts? That should be on the shirts. The director's uh, title is going to be like Blair Witch 3. <laughs> is that a thing? <laughs> Everybody's yeah, nose know. is going to be runny and everybody's going to be shivering looking around at everybody else like, why did we do this? Why did we, <laughs> why did we think this was a good idea? The, the Blair Yeti project. That's what it's going to be. <laughs> All right. Let's, uh, let's, <laughs> I'm still coughing. I don't know what it is. Um, this whatever, whatever I've caught. Us, I'm also going to be hiking up there with whatever infection I have. It's awful. But that's also part of the fun, you know, sniveling and all that at 12,000 to 14,000 feet. Let's take a look at the Skunk Riot control copter. It's uh, built by a South African company called, company called Desert Wolf. Check that thing out. It's going to be shooting people, flying around and shooting people who start riots. That's right. It can shoot them with rubber bullets or it can shoot them with sandbags or maybe paintballs. It can do all kinds of fun things. I imagine the paintballs it can even deploy... are filled with pepper spray because that's a lot of fun. <laughs> this, that's what we're doing from now on when we go do do like a paintball thing paintballs fr frozen paintballs is out paintballs full of pepper spray is the new thing to call your friends all right so that's interesting i mean it, it's very strange that, that the governments in south in south africa have resorted to this i mean apartheid's a mess down there uh t you know racial tension and all that kind of stuff going crazy so south africa is the first place to deploy these sort of things. I can totally see these things being used in other places, possibly even the USA, to stop riots. I mean, they're trying to make things like, I guess not riots, even protests. I mean, I can see them deploying this on peaceful protests and, and places here and there. So the cost of this unit, um, oh, I'm on you, wrong, wrong video. The cost of this unit, $46,000. You think we should get one and play with it maybe? Uh, it'd be a lot of fun to play with, but I'm pretty sure that the crowd, that it would be that you know it would be controlling could probably take it out with a water hose or you know <laughs> perhaps a thrown sling a couple rocks tied together with some fishing twine probably take it out you know i think we need to get one of these and take it like around malls and just it'll it'll be the anti-mall rat weapon because those kids <laughs> they just hang around they loiter they maybe buy an orange julius but they don't buy anything else and they keep people away from the mall because they're like i don't want to go there all those mall rats hang out there so they're costing malls money. So we need to get these things together and sell them to malls as mall rat preventative measures. And then they can, you know, just fly by and shoot them. And the, and the mall rats are not usually smart enough to think of using a water hose or something. They're, they're just going to split and go hang out at their friend's basement or whatever. Yeah, I've thought that through. All right. <laughs> <laughs> Let's move on and um, talk just a little bit about the ex-spy who uh, is, is pioneering the uh, open source movement, Robert David Steele. All right, I'll let you take it from here because uh, you're, you're more on the end with this or you're more um, knowledgeable with this. Basically, the short version is this guy has written a book and it was really interesting and you guys should all go read it and read about the article. But it talks about how open source, like the methodology of open source is one way to run a society. And when you have that level of transparency in a society, a lot of waste and corruption and things like that go away. And so he's looking at it from his experiences with the CIA and with government and saying, you know, we, we really could eliminate a lot of, a lot of waste and, and, and risk and things like that. And I'm very paraphrasing here, but he's, he's basically saying the quickest way to get an answer on the internet is not to post a question, but to post a question and the wrong answer. And then immediately people will respond. And it's, it's like that with pretty much everything he's found. And so he sees the, the role the CIA could play as uh, basically uh, fostering you know, their goal and their agenda with open source and by providing <laughs> technology and things like that. And that in the finance industry and in the banking industry and stuff like that, they are creating things that have phantom value and trading things that have phantom value for things that have real value. So things that have real value are natural resources and land and, and coal and gas and oil and solar energy and things that have phantom values are, uh, you know, uh, securities backed derivatives or quote unquote securities backed derivatives and, you know, mortgage stuff and things that have led to the financial bubble. And so he lays it out, but it's really, it looks like a piece of open source software but it's really not. It's really sort of a formula. And he says that in both the United Kingdom and the United States, all of the economic and social indicators for major revolution are there 
And he thinks that when it comes, it's going to be something that's more along the open source because, quote unquote, the young people get the value in having sort of the open information and the value that comes with that. You know, I think one of the best ways to sum it up is in his book here. I've got the, uh, <clears throat> the quote highlighted here. He says, we are at the end of a 5,000 year plus historical process during which the human society grew in scale while, while it abandoned the early indigenous wisdom, council, um, councils and communal decision making. So I think he, he is saying that with the, uh, I guess, the open source, like, I guess basically an open source the open everything. source method. Method, yeah, the open source method. Uh, we can turn to a more pure way of living. So if, if some of that stuff strikes you, his book may be very interesting. We could probably make a totally separate video on this. We could, you know, sit down and make some bullet points and, and, and make a very thorough video on this. Uh, just talking about this, talking about open source culture, um, and, and talking about how far away that we've, you know, actually gone from how we, I guess, evolved. Also, go watch Quiana Qu Scotsy as well. That's a good one. Think, think about how much energy is wasted when, you know, you have all these politicians that are just spinning things. It's like here we have, you know, like Tom Wheeler, and he's like, you know, coming up with all these great ways to spin what he's doing. And they're using, and you, you've heard other media things say weasel words, like they're describing this as weasel words. And they're, they're not exactly being dishonest, but really, I mean, the, the effect is that they're being dishonest. And all those problems go away when you have that level of transparency. Yep. Well, maybe, uh, I don't know, do you think his stuff is going to catch on? That's the thing that I'm worried about, because I think that, that a lot of the powers that be are not going to want to follow his philosophies. And also, he's been hitting some resistance, even in the CIA and that sort of thing. They're like, hey, no more of this stuff. Cut it out. But then, you know, there's, there's people on his side, and then there's people in powerful places who just would like him to shut up. So uh, I think, I, I don't know, but... He does say revolution is coming, and this might be one form that it takes. So it's interesting. It's just something fun to think about, something, something that we thought we would mention so you guys could go read more about it. All right, let's move on, and let's talk about a new type of computer that um, HP is working on capable of calculating 640, that's sorry, 640 terabytes of data in a billionth of a second. Now, the way that they're putting this together is pretty interesting. Go ahead. I think I've got it on the screen. Yep. So what they're doing is, uh, you know, like... A lot of times people are, are, are making these new systems and instead of having one or two p really powerful cores or even eight powerful cores, they've got just tons and tons and tons of, um, uh, of cores that can do almost anything, you know, like stream processors or CUDA cores or whatever. They can be assigned to do any number of things. Well, they're taking sort of that idea and they're giving you a, a lot of cores, but they're making the different cores specialized. So you get lots of, you know, clusters of cores that are specialized to certain things. So... That's one thing they're doing. The other thing that they're doing differently is they're using um, silicon uh, photonics instead of the traditional copper wires. So it's all, that's going to reduce the uh, energy needed, it's going to reduce the heat, and it's also going to increase the speed. So something like this, I, I mean, they say that maybe something could be coming out um, in, in 2018, and they say it could revolutionize things, but I don't think this article gives me enough information to really exactly know what's going on. Yes, this this machine is basically a skunk works project. Like if I were to categorize this, they have lofty goals. They the R and D department may have the chops to do this. I'm going to remain skeptical. Skeptical. There have been a few articles that have come out and been really critical of this, looking at the engineering challenges. And this is really maybe the first, not really the first attempt, but like the first like PR campaign attempt to take silicon photonics, which has been around for a while and a lot of other technologies that are going to be necessary for quantum computing to try to bring it all together. But with this design, it's really not faster than a classical computer, and it will be many generations before that it is. So it's maybe good that they're doing the R&D, but the hard science and that kind of thing is missing from this, and so I'm going to treat this more like a PR announcement than an actual real we're going to be like AT&T Labs and start spending $10 billion a year on research. I don't see that from HP. Let's talk about something that could possibly be a bit more real, and that's Intel. They've unveiled a new Xeon chip that integrates an FPGA, um, and they're saying that it's going to be 20 times faster. Now, let me just be clear right off the bat. It's not going to be 20 times faster no matter what you're doing. It's only going to be 20 times faster based upon what you have programmed the FPGA to process. Now, the FPGA... Well, maybe 
Go Maybe ahead. we should step back and explain FPGAs. All right, yeah, we could do that. So FPGA, um, the Field Programmable Gate Arrays, that makes no sense to a lot of people out there. Uh, but what this really is, is, is uh, it's, it's kind of like an ASIC in a way, but ASICs are exactly programmed to do one thing, and that's what makes them so damn fast. I'll let you take it away and give them a, a more detailed uh, explanation here of FPGA. So with F FPGA is... If you look at the silicon and you look at the arithmetic logic unit and, you know, uh, superscalar blah, 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 and MMX extensions and, and all of the different instructions that are available, if you're just talking about x86 and all of the different instructions that are available on RISC and all these other architectures, there are these vast and elaborate silicon machines built out of transistors on the die to do work. And the architecture of the machine is, you know, x86 or RISC or ARM or, or whatever it is. And so that is all as a product of the lithography on the silicon. A field programmable gate array is sort of this magical piece of technology that lets you create uh, a mechanism on silicon with something that's a little different that works like as if it was part of a photolithography process on regular silicon. So if you have an idea for implementing a new arithmetic logic unit, or you have an idea for a new encryption algorithm, or you have an idea for a new whatever, instead of breaking that down into instructions that can run on the existing silicon, you can literally rearrange the components of the chip like as if you were creating new silicon, but without actually creating new silicon inside the field programmable gate array. So a lot of uh, password algorithms, like password protection algorithms and things like that, are protected. Uh, the predication of the protection is that it's hard to do those types of computations on x86. And so like Bitcoin mining for a while, Bitcoin mining was on x86 and it wasn't very fast. And then GPUs entered the scene and it's like, well, GPUs are way faster for some kinds of calculations, so we'll use GPUs. Well, field, pro field programmable gate arrays replaced uh, GPUs as prelude to ASICs. Now, an ASIC is always faster. An ASIC is an application-specific IC that has silicon, that has lithography for a very specific purpose. And a field programmable gate array is kind of in the middle of, you know, having something like a bunch of stream processors or, a, a, you know, a dedicated, you know, thing, uh, and an ASIC that is built for something that's special purpose. And so what that lets you do is take a piece of software, load it into the ASIC on these new Xeon chips, and then for that one task, it, the hardware is basically optimized for that task. And so you can realize insanely great benefits for doing it that way versus having to break the problem apart into smaller pieces that your existing silicon can handle. Now, what this is going to do as far as, um, you know, increasing speed in different real-world applications, uh, people can take this and they can apply it to perhaps database instructions. And all of a sudden, database becomes way faster to navigate. Uh, they can take something like this and apply it to even like graphics functionality uh, and make it way faster that way. So there's going to be a lot of really interesting real world applications, but the actual speed boosts are going to be specific, dependent upon whatever, um, you know, instructions that you are giving to the uh, FPGA. So it's a pretty, pretty cool idea that Intel has here. And, and uh, I mean, it's obviously going to be, like, like you said, a lot faster than just a standard Xeon processor by itself just relying upon the hardware and the software. So uh, not here's quite what an ASIC, I read, but, but getting there. Go ahead. Here's, here, here's what I read into that, which is really interesting, I think. So Xeon x86, look how much faster GPUs are for certain kinds of highly parallelizable workloads than CPUs. We've, got, we've gotten to a point where, you know, you've got one to 2,000 stream processors on a GPU, and for certain kinds of calculations, it's orders of magnitude faster than a three or four gigahertz Xeon, even eight core, 16 core. I mean, what are we gonna do? Are we just gonna keep putting cores on this thing? Intel, seeing the trend, came out with the Xeon fee, which is, you know, that add-in card. It's a PCI Express card, just like a graphics card that has a massive amount of processors. It's got like 50 processors, you know, Knight's Core or whatever, you know, doing scientific computation. It's ludicrously expensive compared to a GPU. You can just buy a couple cheap GPUs, slap it in for scientific computation, just verify your work. It's fine. It's cheap, easy, you know, problem solved. Intel's looking at the writing on the wall here and being like, oh crap, x86 is not where it's at anymore. People are adding GPUs to their computing clusters and doing their computation with that. We don't make GPUs. Oh crap, oh crap, oh crap. 
So what do we do? It's like, well, let's try adding FPGAs to Xeons and see how that goes. Because the Xeon fee, I can tell you, they didn't really sell a lot of those. Uh, and, you know, it's like, why would you when you can get a GPU? So, uh... Yeah. All right, let's move right along, and let's talk about, speaking of GPUs, the new GeForce GTX 880 and the GTX 870. It looks like some of these have been spotted, and there's a lot of rumors floating around. But there, are, there have been some tentative specs leaked. It looks like the GTX 880 is going to have 320 more CUDA cores compared to the 780 Ti uh, and the Titan, because they both have, you know... Um, uh, well, I believe it's, well, I guess the new ones are just going to have 3,200 CUDA cores. Um, here's, the, here's the thing, though. This is going to be on Maxwell architecture. Uh, it's going to be using the same 28 nanometer fabrication process. So what's interesting about that is it looks like the, you know, the next generation stuff that's going to be built on the 20 nanometer uh, manufacturing process is not quite ready for mainstream, but they're going to go ahead and come out with the GTX 880. Regardless, it's going to be a bit faster than the 780 Ti. And then, when the 20 nanometer stuff is ready, I would guess that that's going to be the 880, uh, GTX 880 Ti. I keep saying Ti, but it's actually Ti. Um, I don't know why I always say Ti, but yeah, the, the GTX 880 Ti is going to be the, the next thing, the, the step past Maxwell. So, could be interesting to see. I don't think we're going to be seeing that until next year, though. Uh, GTX 880, probably be uh, later on this year. So I'll definitely grab one of those Will Q4. that be the graphics card for 4K gaming? Dot, dot, dot. I don't know, but we're stocking up on monitors to find out. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't think so, but, but who knows. Anyway, let's move right along and uh, check out some stuff from Sharp. Sharp has the first freeform display. Now, a lot of the LCDs that are out right now, pretty much all the LCDs that are out right now, um, they have to have some kind of a backplate, some kind of a bezel, because that's where all the technology is stored. They've got stuff going on in the bezel, bezel stuff going on behind... Um, but Sharp has created this new stuff where they put the technology directly into the display and therefore you can make it any shape you want it. I mean, it, the possibilities are pretty much unlimited. You can make, I mean, look at this, look at this idea for, um, you know, like a dashboard, you know, you, like your uh, tachometer and your, uh, all, all your different gauges in your car and that sort of thing. That is an idea. I mean, uh, interfaces for just about anything, climate control right there, interfaces for just I don't know, I'm just naming stuff right now. You guys can think of stuff uh, on your own, but um, it could really revolutionize the, uh, the, the just the market for screens. Could be this is really, this is in part driven by the miniaturization of everything. Um, a lot of portable uh, devices need more of the stuff built into the screen. And we actually have, in when we, uh, when we modded the Lee and Lee with the iPad Retina display, um, the Retina Display interface is literally DisplayPort. It's embedded DisplayPort. And so it's the beginnings of this, sort of the, the precursor, the predecessor to that, oh, some of that technology, because you can literally plug your video card directly into the LCD panel. There's no scaler, there's no interface, there is nothing. It is literally a DisplayPort interface on the LCD. There is no circuitry. And we need to test the latency on that. It's on my to-do list because that might be a good baseline for input latency versus all other monitors, because it's literally a direct display yeah. port interface to that panel. Hmm. I don't know. I'm going to be curious to see what comes out of this. And uh, what's next on the list? Oh, Amazon. The Amazon phone is finally here. The Fire phone. The Fire phone that will not catch on fire. Hopefully not. Anyway. No, so it's the going specs, to catch on fire. <laughs> the, the, the specs are pretty impressive. Um, I, I guess let's go ahead and just start off with my, with my problem, because I... I when I saw the specs, I was like, yeah, I, I wouldn't mind having one of those. And then you have to deal with uh, Amazon's proprietary closed-down version of Android. They like to keep nope. you inside their walled garden. Go ahead. What were you saying? Oh, no, I was just saying nope. I just, yep. I, I just nope. noped out of there. <laughs> nope. That's all. I just, just wanted to nope right on out of there. Well, they've got something that's interesting, um, kind of new, called the, it's called Firefly. Now, there's actually a Firefly button here on the side of your phone, and this could be the best button ever to harvest tons of data from their customers, but it's also a button that will help to remove uh, competition. So here's what you could do with this button. Uh, you can use this button like a lot of the pre-existing apps that will listen to the music that's playing in a bar or where, if you're out and about, if you're with your friends on the radio, and it will find the song on Amazon for you and then say, hey, you can buy this song if you want. That's one thing it's going to do. Um, but the... the one problem I have with that is, you know, if this thing can listen, 
how much is it going to be listening? Is it going to always be listening? Is it going to be listening for, for cues and, and that sort of thing so that, they, so that they can market better to you? I don't know, kind of, kind of a, something that's got me scratching my head. The other thing that it will let you do is, I mean, a lot of these apps have been out there before. They're just putting it together and keeping it inside their Amazon walled garden or their walled Amazon, I guess. Never mind. Uh, <laughs> their walled Amazon, Amazonian weirdness. Their walled the, Amazonian. The Amazonian. <laughs> yeah, their walled Amazonian rainforest. Anyway, um, the other thing that you can do with this is you can go into different places and take pictures of existing products. It will search for those products on Amazon and find, you know, possibly a better price. So you can go into retail stores and, like, people have already been doing this with barcode scanners and that sort of thing. The thing that makes this a little different is it is inside Amazon's garden. So everything's going to be harvested by Amazon, number one. They're going to be like, hey, now we know this person loves all these these things. And they can, I'm not sure how if they can use that for marketing, if they're just going to use that to recommend you products and that sort of thing. So, so to some people, that's going to be awesome. You know, that's going to be like, this is great. It makes my life easier. It learns who I am and it tells me what I should get based upon what I currently like. To other people, that's going to be an invasion of privacy, but it's going to be up to you. For me, I'm done with it. So... All right, that's pretty much all I want to say about that. you have anything to add before we move on? No, I already noped all the way out of there because... <laughs> you, just, uh, <laughs> you just noped. All right, well, how about, how about the Galaxy S5 LTE A? With, it's got the, uh, the Quad HD display. I mean, 2560 uh, by 1440. It's a 5.1-inch uh, display, 2.5 gigahertz. It's got, it's got Android 4.4 KitKat. Are you completely done with Samsung as well? I am completely done with Samsung until they <laughs> ditch TouchWiz, or at least give me the option to turn it off. <laughs> Yep. So that's that. <laughs> Don't whiz um, on the electric uh, Samsung. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know the specs touch on this. Whiz? But the, the specs on this one are are, are so awesome. Like th these specs are amazing. They're great specs. You can also get they it. They are with, amazing. Uh, three gigabytes it's of just, RAM. I've got, I mean, I've got to deal with it for two years. If, I, if it's only a year, maybe somebody <laughs> wants to send me one. Maybe <laughs> I don't know. Samsung's a bit psychotic, so I, th that that's worrisome but you know if you get this phone and you put a custom rom on there i don't know that, that that those specs with a custom rom could be really awesome i'm still waiting for the one plus one frankly but let me go back to me i'm a little bit pissed off with one plus one right now they keep delaying it i know they're delaying it because of the the ssl bug um you know and they're trying to make sure everything's patched up for that but the way that they're marketing this thing is kind of giving me a weird feeling like they're making you invite all kinds of people and it's almost like they're it, turning it into just this crazy game where everyone's inviting people and Facebook likes and all kinds of crazy stuff like that. Just give me a price and let me buy the goddamn thing. Okay, one plus one, please. Or send me one for review. I've requested 40 of them. And uh, yeah, no. <laughs> <laughs> anyway. That, that's really how it should go. I mean, it's not, uh, you know, any alternative. Can somebody recommend, like, the best phone in the world to run Cyanogen Mod on other than OnePlus One? Because we probably get a very similar experience. Yeah, I mean, I just like the fact that the OnePlus One is so customizable. Uh, and it also has, you know, it comes in 64 gigabyte flavor as well. Give me, I don't care if you give me a phone with, with um, I guess, a smaller integrated uh, NAND or whatever, just as long as it has... Uh, micro SD. I'm happy. Anyway, let's uh, let's talk about some some PC hardware. Get away from all these phones and stuff. Asus has been predicting that the PC shipments are going to increase, uh, and that's because the tablets have slowed down. Um, I'm not sure if tablets slowing down means PC increases. That might mean that a lot of the people who want tablets have them, and there's no reason for them to upgrade right now. But Asus is predicting that you know PCs are going to go back up because well for any number of reasons, but um, a, a couple desktop mentioned Desktop sales are, had been a lot stronger than expected the first half of the year. Like in terms of desktop computer sales, people were like, why would anybody buy a desktop? But sales actually have not been terrible. Yeah, they've, they've, they're have they still the number one board manufacturer. 10.4 uh, million motherboard shipments. But listen to this. Gigabyte was at 10.3 million. So Gigabyte is wow. really catching up to Asus. That is, that's a huge deal. Asus has been number one for as long as I can remember, but Gigabyte is getting way up there with Asus. So We do have some and, upcoming Z97 reviews from Gigabyte and a review of a 290X now that you can actually buy them because they're not being bought for Bitcoin mines everywhere. Yeah, you know, we, we work with Asus a lot because they are very, they are very supportive. And 
It's not because they've given us any money, which they have not given us any money for reviews. They never give us money for reviews. They never gave us money when JJ came to town. They were just very supportive, and they had new stuff, and they wanted to show it. If the other companies uh, were the same, that would be amazing. It would be awesome to work with more products from Gigabyte. So, so I do want to say thanks to Gigabyte uh, for sending over some stuff for review. We've worked with uh, MSI before as well, but um, we do want to give fair covers to everyone. It's just that we have, you know, sometimes with the small we, staff, whoever's the most supportive. Every year, in yeah, go ahead. Go oh ahead. well, sorry. I, it's it's just every year we have that conversation with these guys, and uh, you know, every year it's like, hey, do you, you know, do you have anybody? That, I, we don't say, do you have anybody like JJ that we can interface with? And uh, you know, I guess I, I guess one of the people that we work with got tired because didn't they say it's like, no, we don't have a JJ, but we didn't say. We just like, do you have anybody that you work, you know, that knows all the products and we can ask questions and the blah, blah, blah. And yeah, we were I'll, describing JJ, but we never mentioned JJ. And they literally came back to us and said, no, we don't have a JJ. Yeah, they, they quoted and said, like, we're trying to find a JJ, but we currently do not have a JJ. <laughs> yeah, we just that, thought that, that was happened. funny because that actually happened. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, the, the bottom line is I would really prefer to give equal time to all the motherboard manufacturers out there. Um, and that's just, that's the bottom line. That's where I'm going to leave it. Just sometimes that, we get way more support that from a, Asus as far as them sending every product in the world. And then we're like, oh, look at all the stuff we've got. And so, of course, we're going to show you guys everything we've got and hang out with JJ. So, anyway, what do you got there? Is that our, is that our last hardware thing? Because I have a mini review that I was going to sneak in here. <laughs> um, yeah, I think that's pretty much it. We're going to get into science coming up next. Yeah, okay. science is next. What do you, what do you got there? What are you, what are you so, sneaking? <laughs> Look what we have. It's that thing from you got, Linksys. Where did you get the AC? <laughs> <laughs> Here's the review. So this is a thing, and they're like, it's going to be like our version of the GS, and we're going to help you put new firmware on it, and uh, blah, 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 and it's going to be amazing, and it's you can run Linux. And guess what? You can't run Linux. They never release anything. It has been four months. Shame. Shame. <laughs> Shame. Wait a minute. Okay, review. D wait, review DDWRT? Over. Does it come with DDWRT? Nope. What do you mean, nope? Nope. No, that's what they told us at CES. They were like, DDWR DDWRT will be on this. Like, uh, DDWRT.com. Allow me to quote Monday, 421, 2014. With the availability of the Linksys WRT-1900AC, there are some conflicting information circulating regarding DDWRT support for this new router from Linksys slash Belkin. To avoid confusion and frustration for early buyers and users interested to use this router with DDWRT, we'd like to clarify the current situation of the development work. Despite some information published by some news services indicating the availability of DDWRT for the WRT-1900AC, there is currently no specific release plan for this router because it's using all new Marvell Wi-Fi, blah, blah, blah. We must first run a very detailed evaluation. We're in talks with Belkin here, but there are a couple of issues like missing documentation and sources to be solved before we can make the decision to support the WRT. WRT 1900 AC. <clears throat> this is a sad day. I mean, the, is the router still any good? Or I mean, the firmware really is almost more important than the hardware when you're talking about consumer stuff. If you're building your own, you can build whatever you want. But a lot of the consumer it's, grade stuff, the firmware. From is my really point important. of view, it's two hundred and fifty dollars. It was sold like as if you could run a custom firmware on it. But here we are, months later. There is no custom firmware. It was sold under false pretenses. Maybe that's why, because I've been talking to these guys for a long time, and I would like to, you know, work with them, but they, they haven't sent anything yet because they were still working some working on some things. So maybe that's why, because they knew I would yell and scream about that. I don't know. And and I, in fact, am yelling and screaming. But the second <laughs> they come out with a reasonable firmware, the second we'll do a review. And you know, who knows? Maybe like on some obscure forum somewhere, there's an alpha version, and someone will post in the comments. But. I was really disappointed to go to the DDWRT site and see, oh, it's not here, and nothing. All right, let's talk about, um, well, this is, I guess this is kind of science, but it's kind of the world, and let's just go to Singapore and talk about what they're doing. They've decided they want to be the world's first smart nation. So they're installing some sensors and some cameras all over the place, uh, and the, these sensors and cameras are going to do things like detect um, uh, congestion in traffic. They're going to detect air pollution. Uh, they're even going to detect uh, litter. And, and they're going to say, hey, there's some litter right here. And let's say you're someone who likes to throw stuff on the ground. You may even hear, hey, pick that up. Like you throw it on the ground and you're going to like, I'm, I'm, not sure, I'm just making this up right now because they said that they were going to work on some ways to quote unquote 
warn people that litter. Maybe you'll get a letter in the mail that says, hey, this camera and this sensor caught you throwing something on the ground, you little bastard. Here's $500 fine. But I think it'd be a lot more fun if there was actually a voice that said, hey, pick that up, citizen. Um, that Some of this may sound a bit invasive. They're doing this under the pretense of, quote unquote, being a smart nation. And Singapore is, a, is, is just way farther than a lot of the other stuff um, that, in that part of the world. Uh, I guess it's uh, just, just south of Malaysia, so it's really hot down there. I'm not sure exactly what the situation is in Malaysia as far as internet goes, but in Singapore, they have um, pretty much all over the city gigabit internet, you know, comparable to Google Fiber. Um, all that's been in place for a while. And, and they look like they're taking steps to become a very clean uh, city. So uh, that's, that's pretty interesting. But they want to be the world's first smart nation. Do you think smart nations are a thing that's going to start rolling out in other places? Uh, and do you think that that could tie into the surveillance state? That's my question. To, to everyone in the comments, but also you, Wendell. Well, yeah. I mean, this is obviously going to lead to the surveillance state. It can't not. Uh, and the, the information can't not be abused. So, <sighs> but we I mean, should not build such things. But, uh, but uh, well, I mean, a lot of it does sound like a good idea. And it seems like as we move into a, a, you know, a very technology-focused future, I mean, this stuff is just going to happen. I mean, if you... Look at any sci-fi movie. You know, look at the, the the Fifth Element or whatever. Anywhere he goes, there's there's stuff looking at him, cameras on him. It just seems like when you have technology everywhere, that's just what's going to happen. And should we just live with it? I mean, how do you fight back against that? Do you go live on a farm somewhere and and refuse to be microchipped? Is that the only <laughs> option? It was in a Keanu Reeves movie. He was wearing this suit that kept changing his faces. That's what we're going to need. <laughs> <laughs> what movie was that? A suit that changed his favorite at the Lawnmower uh, Man or something? Or? Scanner Darkly. I don't even no, no, know. No, no, it was a Scanner Darkly, which wasn't a terrible movie. Except for Keanu Reeves. Whoa. Whoa. <laughs> Whoa. <laughs> All right, let's, let's, we got more agents to talk about. So, uh, how know, about... Kung Fu. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that that was sorry. not... That has nothing to do with the agent stuff we're talking about. That was Keanu Reeves in case someone in Asia wants to get offended. But hey, if you want to get offended... Do it! <laughs> it's awesome. <laughs> you can do whatever you want. I love when people get Is offended. Is it really offensive if the person who said it didn't mean it in an offensive way? <laughs> if you choose to get offended, by all means. So, oh. yeah. Some people, some people love to get offended. Like yes. Yes, they vegans. do. <laughs> I just offended all the vegans. Do you see how that worked? I just offended all... <laughs> Never mind. Um, let's move on right now. Uh, <laughs> there's going to be... I'm going to get hate mail... For talking about uh, vegans. You can't even mention vegans in a positive light. Never mind. <laughs> Let's talk about... <laughs> Veganomics. <laughs> oh, God. Right, let's take a look at these two one-kilometer-tall buildings, which will be the, it'll be the tallest, um, I guess, pair of towers in the world when, when these are erected. Not the tall, tallest building in the world, the tallest pair of towers in the world. And just the idea for these, these buildings, it's um, a UK-based architect is working with, uh, I'm not sure, Hao Yan... Uh, group and uh, it's going to be building this in uh, Wuhan and just I just want to show some of these pictures here this building looks ridiculous now what they're going to do is they've got um, so solar panels on the outside they've got fuel cells in the bottom let me just bring up that slide here that shows everything they're doing uh, there's a solar power they've got a wind turbine on the top uh, thermal chimney as well uh, there's the, the the photovoltaics on the outside like I say in the solar panels rainwater harvesting evaporated uh, cooling uh, Green walls on the inside, they're going to be growing all kinds of stuff. Uh, it's going to be ridiculous. Biomass boilers as well. So these buildings are going to be like their own little, I guess, power plants and, and ecosystems. So it looks like there's, a, if you see some of these other pictures here, on the sides here, these, these platforms and that sort of thing, it looks like those are going to be places where you can go outside. That's like a, a park. Uh, I mean, this is like the Hanging Gardens of Babylon type stuff here. The technology, there we go. There, look at this floor plan. Looks amazing. They're going to build the Acropolis from SimCity. That's pretty much what it is right here. They, someone played too much SimCity and sat down and were like, hmm, <laughs> let's build that in Wuhan. And there it is. So I definitely want to go check this out once it is uh, completed, but this is going to take a, a bit of time. I was extremely impressed with everything they were building in China uh, when I was over there. It, it, a lot of the stuff looks like it's from Blade Runner, 20 years in the future. Just driving down the road, you, a lot of the buildings like have this crazy like you know curved walls and gla giant glass ceilings and stuff it was pretty futuristic looking especially when we flew out of new york and landed over there it was like we flew out of the old world and we landed in this like future crazy place 
but this is probably going to be a step beyond any anything that we even saw while we were there. So, pretty cool. All right, ready to talk about some video game stuff, shall we? Oh, Move video on. games. Yay. Yes. Yeah, we're not going to get into video games too awful much because that's what the, uh, the WASD is for. But I do want to talk about a few things. Um, the Electronic Arts CEO sat down and said it is time for a fundamental shift in how they make games. And it looks like a, a lot of times what they do is they... They, they close off con, you know, communication with the community while they're developing the game, and they keep lots of secrets. They've got like an old-school Hollywood mentality where it's just like, you know, when it's done, it's going to come out and it's going to blow your mind. But until then, we've got this it's very, very secret. And now that he's, he's looked at a lot of the indie games and how they're working and how they're opening up to the community, they're opening up alphas to the community, and they're looking for community feedback. So he said that right now what they're going to do is they're going to try to make the game very fun and playable from an early stage, and then allow the community to give them feedback. So it's interesting to see that EA is going to be listening to the community. Um, nope. they, they've EA, traditionally EA, they're the world's worst company. Work. Go ahead. This, this will never... Not, well, I mean, okay, yes, EA is one of the world's worst companies, this aside. This will never work with a company like EA because it turns too much into camel built by committee. There are people inside of EA that have accumulated power by exploiting the poor, downtrodden... Uh, proletariat, <laughs> no, I mean, pro programmer, <laughs> programmer is the other P word I'm looking for. <laughs> it's just right the proletariat, I don't know. And yep. uh, the, the, uh, the situation inside of EA is that you've got all these middle managers and pointy-haired boss that think that their idea is worthwhile and that they're awesome and that they're God's gift to game design. And so this will only turn into the most amazing comedy ever because the community will actually <laughs> have good ideas and play with things. And the pointy haired bosses will be like, oh, I don't know if that makes sense. Let's get up with some bigger guns or let's turn that into DLC. <laughs> and uh, so this is just going to end and just it's 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 really going to be the most amazing disaster ever. Just just it's going to be a train wreck in slow motion. It's going to be great. So it's like sociopaths trying to mimic what they see the indie community doing and then failing miser miserably. This is going to be a lot of fun. I think you just nailed it. So <laughs> This yeah. guy is going to look at it and he's going to be like, I don't understand what went wrong. And it's like, let me give you, you want to go in a different direction. You want to make your company like something that's not like this. Don't be an asshole. Don't be an asshole. <laughs> and then that, like start there, start small, and then, you know, work from there. That's a good t-shirt. We should make that. <laughs> All right. Um, I want to talk about um, Ubisoft. People are freaking out right now about Ubisoft. I'm about to freak out about Ubisoft. Now, I did not buy Watch Dogs. I was really looking forward to Watch Dogs, and when it, the game came out, I thought it looked pretty interesting, but the gameplay looked somewhat derivative, and it just, I don't know, something was weird about it. It didn't look like the old, like, it, it didn't look as crazy as it did way back when they were showing their trailers, like, at E3 2012. Well, apparently, they were using completely different graphic settings at E3 2012. And all of those files are still somewhere in the game files. Now, you know, here's, here's on Reddit, there's an, an article about this. And this is something that's happened this week, and every, everyone should already know about this, right? So now there's a mod out, and you can change the graphics back to the way they should be. It's pretty much like a, a, a lighting mod, like the shadows and the, the light sources and that sort of thing are much better. Um, explosions. Yeah, explosions are way better, I mean, better particle effects and that sort of thing. So... Yeah, that, that happened, and um, there's some speculation as to why th this has happened. I'm going to leave some of that for Waz show. You can see them get into more detail with this. But my big worry right now is the fact that Far Cry 4 is an Ubisoft game, and it looks like a beautiful game, and they're showing off some amazing footage of Far Cry 4. And that should be all good, right? But... Nope. <laughs> nope. Ubisoft came out and, and said that if you're going to be playing this on the... Um, uh, on the PS4 or the Xbox One, you are going to, they are going to guarantee that you're going to get the best experience. What? Why have you forsaken the PC audience? <laughs> because there's no way that those consoles could give you the best experience. That is impossible. The only way that those consoles could give you the best experience is if you nerfed the PC game so that it would match the console. All I've got to say here, I'm going to put this little GIF on the screen right now. It's like screen. saying that you're going to have the best experience with Skyrim on the console because we cocked up the controls on PC, but <laughs> somebody else will fix that later. <laughs> yeah, that's that's uh, let me just uh, there. That's that's exactly what's going on right now. So anyway, yeah, there'll be there'll be a lot more on that on uh, <clears throat> Wazd, but basically this, yeah. <laughs> All right, do we have anything nice to talk about right here? 
No, it really it really does seem to be a situation where Sony or someone came to them and said, "Hey, you know, let's make it the same experience on everything." And they were like, "Okay, sounds good." Now, you know, not a, a lot of, of people money. have three or four hundred dollar video cards to be able to do this, but you know, it's actually the situation that uh, the, some of the stutter and things like that are improved because it wasn't a rush hack job to remove all this stuff at the last second on the PC version. It seems to be the case that some of this was removed so haphazardly and so hurriedly that some of the performance issues of this on PC is actually because they've done crazy stuff to, to try to remove it, not to try to get it to run right. And it actually runs better with some of this stuff turned on than it does with it turned off. Yep, I, I can say firsthand I have seen it running, and it looks... Oh God, it's... It's not that it's it ridiculous. looks better, it's that it runs better. Yeah. Which is crazy. I'm, I'm not, like I said, I'm, I'm not going to get into it any more than that because you guys are going to have to watch Waz because they're going to go off. Uh, Waz is actually going to be pretty crazy this week. It, it, it's going to be a good episode with lots of controversy type stuff to talk about, including some feminist controversy stuff. So you guys should definitely watch that and uh, call Anita Zarkeesian and uh, she's going to want to watch it as well. Anyway, that's uh, it for this episode of The Tech. It's, uh, yeah, it's time for us to go make some more hardware videos. i got to finish testing this Revo drive, and uh, then we've got some more 4K videos. So just stay tuned for everything that's coming out. Thank you guys for watching, and thank you guys for hooking us up with tech support. That's making uh, life a lot better for everyone involved, and we, need, we do need to grow. We've got too many products. We need, like, I think we need, like, one more person soon. But if you like us, sign up for when, tech support so we can hire more people. <laughs> yeah, when, 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 when we get the one, just, just enough for one more person, I think it'll be good for like a few years of, of, of steady growth. It's, it's that thing where like one more person will increase uh, productivity like 800%. You know what I mean? Yes. So. Well, and people should know that we've, you know, we've also turned down uh, money to do things that are not unscrupulous, but um, let's call it more commercialized than, the, than we were really comfortable with. And so, you know, we are not, we are not on a, you know, burnout path. We, we definitely are on a plan to not, to not grow too much year over year because you have to, uh, overcommit yourself to, and we would rather commit to the community as long as the community called, supports us. I, you know, I was called a sellout for this whole land party thing and that kind of hit a nerve with me and I'm going to end with this. Uh, it really did hit a nerve with me. I like, if I feel like things are going in the wrong direction, but you guys need to understand that we are working with a lot of different YouTube channels here. And we're going to be making our own videos. So please do not worry that we are going to water down our content or anything like that. Uh, I would not be able to sleep if we watered down our content. And we I, have full I'm creative already, control. Yeah, yeah, we have full, full creative control here. So no one's telling us what to do. They are just helping us. And they are enabling us to do what we tell them we're going to do. And when I, whenever we talk to anybody about anything, we're like, this is what we're going to do. If you don't like it, don't give us any money. Somebody else will. Or we'll just do it ourselves well, anyway. So it worked out well, this way. Not, not only that, but, I mean, how progressive and awesome is it that we have sponsors that are willing to do that with us? I mean, you know, don't, don't poison the well here, you, you know, naysayers out there, because the sponsors have been awesome in understanding that this is what we do, how we do it and not, no, you must do this for us. It's like, we're going to go play land games on a mountain, which is crazy, and we have sponsors to help us do it. That's amazing, and they understand that that's how it works, and they should be thanked. Well, they understand. You know, we talked to several different people as well, and I, and, and, and a lot of them were like, that's, you're gonna do what? No, that's not <laughs> something that we do. do you yeah, have we're not gonna khaki? sponsor that. <laughs> If you have a pair of khaki <laughs> pants, you can come with us and go to a, a thing and, and jump up on stage and sell crap. And I was like, nah, I'm not going to do that. So, yeah. Anyway. <laughs> it's like Best Buy will give us sponsorship if we set up a little Best Buy kiosk at the top of the mountain. But that doesn't mean we're going to do it. <laughs> <laughs> All right. That's, that's like this. world's highest Best Buy. <laughs> Open for one day. <laughs> For 15 minutes, because that's about all the time we're going to spend up there. Everyone's going to freeze to death or whatever. And who knows about what else is going to go on. It's going to be a lot of fun. Anyway, that's the end of the episode. I hope you liked it. If not, didn't be offended. <laughs> I'm not going to stop you. All right, bye. Bye, everybody. <laughs> <laughs>